Well, we'll continue our study of the book of Deuteronomy with session 14. And we're going to do chapters 29 and 30. And again, this is the third sermon of three sermons that make up the, the book. And again, we are in the final section of the, of the pro forma treaty structure that appears to be part of the background. Now, Deuteronomy 29 is called by some scholars the Palestinian Covenant. Uh, Louis Barry Schaefer considered chapters 28 to 30 to be the covenant. The Schofield Reference Bible considers it considers from 29 to chapter 30, verse 10. And um, J. Vernon McGee takes that same view. But um, in any case, Moses is taking a personal appeal to the people in front of him and uh, to, to make a commitment to the God that is honoring them. And uh, these are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. You might even have extended that. He made the first covenant with Adam in Genesis 3.15. And then he uh, made the, uh, 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 obviously the, the, the one at, uh, and then he called Abraham, made a covenant with Abraham in Genesis 12. Then he made a covenant with them in uh, Exodus at Sinai. And now he's reconfirming that here at Moab, before the, just before they enter the promised land. So Moses called unto all Israel and said unto them, Ye have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, unto Pharaoh, and to all, unto all his servants, and unto all his land. Now these covenants, as I say, this is a continuation of a string of covenants. Adam in Genesis 3.15, Abraham in Genesis 12, Sinai, or the, Horeb is a synonym for that, Exodus 20-23, through 23, and now we're at Moab in Deuteronomy 5 and following. The great temptations which thine eyes have seen, the signs, and those great miracles. Yet the Lord hath not given you a heart to perceive, and the eyes to see, and the ears to hear unto this day. Moses being very candid about their hard-heartedness. One reason they wandered in the wilderness for 38 years is because of a lack of faith. And that was particularly astonishing when you realize the very generation that was involved was the one that was delivered with the parting of the sea and, and, and all these uh, theatricals, I might call them, uh, in, Genesis, in Exodus 12 and following. And yet they didn't have the faith to do what God told them to do, to go into the land. So, um, so Moses is giving them a hard time here. But see, we need to remember something here. The simplest spiritual insights are only by the Holy Spirit. In the flesh. Your flesh is at enmity with God. And uh, any insights that you have from the Scripture or spiritually are gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's only by God's grace that we even can see spiritually. So then I have led you... Forty years in the wilderness, your clothes are not waxing old upon you, and your shoe is not waxing old upon thy foot. Can you imagine being in the desert for forty years and your shoe's not wearing out? Uh, you know, and these aren't, I don't, these aren't figures of speech. This is referred to several times. It's a supernatural providence, obviously. You have not eaten bread, neither have ye drunk wine or strong drink, that ye might know that I am the Lord your God. And when ye came unto this place... Sihon the king of Heshbon and Og the king of Bashan came out against us unto battle, and we smote them. Now, this is, we've talked about this earlier in the book, but those were the two major battles that occurred prior to Canaan. They were still on the east side of the Jordan. Sihon the king of Heshbon and Og the king of Bashan. Og was the king of the giants. You remember all that. Came out against us unto battle, and we smote them. And we took their land and gave it for an inheritance unto the Reubenites, unto the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Remember, these two and a half tribes were so fond of that terrain that we call the Golan Heights. Is they said, we'll stay here. This is good for cattle raising. That's what we want to do. And Moses said, no problem. You can have this, but you've got to first stay with us till we conquer the land as we cross the Jordan. And we, when we succeed, you can come back here. You leave your wives and kids. You guys can come back. And, but you need to do your, pay your dues for, the, for, the, for, the, for your uh, fellow countrymen. And they agreed to do that, which they did. But it's interesting, you know, they picked that out. It wasn't assigned to them by God. See, the rest of them, they do lots, and they got all the land assigned by lot, by, by, by drawing straws, so to speak. Um, uh, it's interesting, they didn't. They got what they thought was the choice spot up there, except they were also the first to go into captivity, because that's where they're next to Syria. It's a, it's a proverbial area anyway. Uh, you know, there's, there's more to it than that. But in any case, uh, 
We took their land, gave it for inheritance to the Reubenites, to Gadite, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And uh, keep, therefore, the words of this covenant, and do them, that ye may prosper in all that ye do. And stand this day, all of you, before the Lord your God, your captains of your tribes, your elders, your officers, with all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and the stranger that is in thy camp, from the hewer of thy wood unto the drawer of thy water. Thou shouldest enter into the covenant which the Lord thy God, and into his oath which the Lord thy God maketh with thee this day. It's interesting, theologically profound, to recognize that the covenant is linked to his oath. God made a covenant, but he also swore by it. And uh, this is, uh, and by the way, this enter into the covenant of the Lord is a phrase in the Hebrew which literally means pass over, pass over into or emigrate. It's not the word for Passover, it's Peshach, but it's a similar Hebrew, but it means to pass over, pass into. And it really seems to echo Genesis 15. You may recall God had Abraham prepare a classic ritual for a covenant where you take, where you take a sacrifice, split it into two, and the two people make the covenant, march with a figure eight between the two pieces, reciting the terms of the agreement. That was the most sacred ritual in those days. And God has Abram set that all up. Then he puts Abraham in a deep sleep, and God goes through that alone by himself. The point he's making, it's unconditional. Abraham had nothing to contribute to it. It's a one-way deal. But again, it was, a, it was sworn under oath. And it was reconfirmed in Genesis 22, and reconfirmed to his descendants, Isaac and Jacob, in uh, Genesis 26. And I'm fond of pointing out that when it was reconfirmed in Genesis 26, both Isaac and Jacob were in conditions of disobedience. So the, the, the idea of they had something to do with it is, 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 is null and void. No, that's an eternal covenant, and it's reconfirmed in Hebrews 6 and elsewhere. But now this covenant with the Lord thy God and his oath is the, uh, is the one he's... The word abar is to pass over and go through it. It echoes of Genesis 15, the, the, the thing I just mentioned. And uh, then he goes on, that, that he may establish thee today for a people unto himself, that he may be unto thee a God as he hath said unto thee, and as he hath sworn unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And uh, it's interesting, in Hebrews chapter 6, the writer to Hebrews points out, he says, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, his unchangeability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for a refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. And it goes on. So the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, you want to take a look at. Anyway, Deuteronomy 29, verse 14, Neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath, but with him that standeth here with us this day before the Lord our God, and also with him that is not here with us this day. For ye, for ye know how we have dwelt in the land of Egypt, and how we came through the nations which we passed by. And uh, the whole, the, the, that's part of the reason he's, he's just summarizing their whole history here. And ye have seen their abominations and their idols, wood and stone, silver and gold, which were among them. Lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God, to go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. And it come to pass that when he heareth the words of this curse, that he bless himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of mine heart, to add drunkenness to thirst. The Lord will not spare him. But then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smote against that man, and all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him, and the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. There are no secret sins. Moses is emphasizing here that he may think that he can keep this imagination in his own heart and God not know it. That's kidding yourself. And God is serious. And God takes himself seriously. God takes his law seriously. We can be thankful that God also has gone to such extremes as to provide us a remedy for our inability to keep that law by God doing it for us and the incredible plan of redemption that is the primary theme of the Bible from 
the first verse to the last, all the way through. It's interesting, this idea of blotting out and so forth, we find in Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19. John writes, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Concluding verses. It's only a verse or two from the end of the book. Same echoing, similar thought. The scope of this verse is the, is the book of Revelation, of course, not the, the 66 books of the Bible, although one could probably make a case, but let's move on. Verse 21 of Deuteronomy 29. And the Lord shall separate him unto evil out of all the tribes of Israel according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in the, this book of the law. So the generation to come of your children that shall rise up after you and the stranger that shall come from a far land shall say when they see the plagues of that land and the sickness which the Lord hath laid upon it and that whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning that is not sown nor beareth any nor any grass groweth therein like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adama and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and his wrath, even all nations shall say, Wherefore hath the Lord done this unto this land? What meaneth the heat of his, this great anger? Boy, um, you know, what we need to remember, when you, when you go down to the Dead Sea, you know, you usually take a day from Jerusalem and go over to Jericho and then go south and uh, go by Qumran, see that, uh, and you go further, you got the Dead Sea. And the southern end of the Dead Sea, of course, is the site of, uh, the original site of Sodom and Gomorrah. When you see this, here you even have, in such an arid place, a lake, called the Salt Lake, or the Dead Sea, uh, almost 1,300 feet below sea level. Um, it is so dense with minerals you can float in it. It's a very strange feeling. You want to make sure you don't drink any of the water. It's pretty bad for you, mineral. But it's a bizarre feeling to float in it. You can, it, 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 you really, because um, the water has such a high specific gravity. But what you don't realize is Sodom and Gomorrah were an Eden. In Genesis 13.10, when Lot sees that, that's the place of all the areas that he and and Abraham were traveling, that's the place where they had to split up because they're getting both too big. That's what he chose. It was incredibly beautiful. Visualize it like the, well, the, the region was called the Fertile Crescent. It was the cradle of civilization, that, the, the Mesopotamia, the whole re general region. But specifically, the Sodom and Gomorrah was, uh, was the region that, um, where those towns grew that was blessed beyond the others. And of course, incurred God's judgment and uh, you go there now, and it's, it's, uh, it's hard to describe. It's uh, pretty sulfured, uh, dusty, uh, uh, pretty grim stuff. So um, what God is saying, that uh, when God judges a land, that's the way it's going to be. That's the way, I believe, Babylon's going to end up being. It has yet to rise to power, but I believe it's going to become a centroid in human history once again, but in order to receive the judgment that is Isaiah 13, 14, and Jeremiah 15, 51 detail, and it, the graphic description, the, 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 the very graphic description of its destruction is, is uh, very similar. In fact, both Jeremiah and Isaiah use the Sodom and Gomorrah as the parallel. Not only that will be that desolate, but it will happen that quickly in one day. Okay. Um, then men shall say, Because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. For they went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they knew not and whom he had not given unto them. The anger of the Lord was kindled against this land to bring upon it all the curses that are written in this book. And the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land, as it is this day. It's interesting, you can actually go through verses, chapters 29 and 30 in detail, the prophecies. They sound like generalizations, but if you read it, there's seven specific prophecies that really recover, they really will, you can identify, parallel them with the Babylonian captivity on the one hand, and the Nazi Holocaust on the other, and the final regathering that we're, I think, on the threshold of. But let's move on. In verse 29, last verse of this ch chapter, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. 
But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. You remember, that's where it got Adam and Eve in trouble in the first place. That's what Satan tempted. If you eat this fruit tree, you'll have this you know, special neat knowledge, you know. Uh, it's interesting how all through history there are these secret societies that claim to have inside secrets, whether it's the, the Masons or the Illuminati or the whatever, the Rosicrucians. You no, know, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed, there are, uh, those things that God reveals to us. And the Bible is full of increasing revelations. You know, one of the things that makes Bible study such fun is we are continually discovering things. Um, uh, I've studied the Bible for, what, 50 years, 40, 50? Anyway, more, more years than you want to count. <laughs> I was in Britain a few weeks ago, and someone was called to my attention. It blew me away. Now, most of you, unless you've had ad advanced math, this may not mean much to you. Most of us know about pi. Pi, pi is a, a dimensionless constant that relates the diameter to the circumference of a circle or the volume of a sphere or whatever. It's a very, very fundamental constant in the universe. There's another one you may not have encountered unless you're in electrical engineering or in advanced mathematics called E, the log to the base E. It's called a natural logarithm. Um, it's, it, it shows up in all kinds of advanced formulas. It's another basic constant of the universe. It's dimensionless and so forth. Well, it turns out, apparently, that if you take Genesis 1.1, and take the product of the letters and divide it by the product of the words. You know, Hebrew and, and Greek both have numerical values for all the letters. So you can play games like that. You can take, take the product of all the letters, divide it by the product of all the words. It comes out to pi in four decimal places. That's kind of weird. And a lot of zeros. But um, You go to John 1.1. 1, 1. These are two, two verses that are pivotal for the creation. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, okay. John 1.1. 1, 1. You do the same thing there in the Greek. Take the product of the letters, divide by the product words, you get E to four decimal places. Now that's too weird to know what to do with. Um, and yet it's too, it's too bizarre to ignore, and yet it's, I don't know what, you, I, I, I'm not saying, it didn't, except you have to just stand back in awe. See, the rabbis, some of the rabbis have an idea that, the, that not only did God create the universe, but he, the Torah was the template by which he did it. And when I hear those things, I always smile because it sounds like a colorful exaggeration. <laughs> but then when I find the value of pi hidden in the text of Genesis 1-1 and the value of E hidden in the value of John 1-1, I have two reactions. One is just one of awe. As a, see, as I see it as a fingerprint of the Creator with sort of a smile on his face, you know, because E wasn't discovered by mathematicians until, what, the 17th century or whatever. The second reaction I have is I, I feel like writing a program and searching, wonder what constants, are there any other constants that are in the universe? That, where are they hidden? You know, I have the feeling that there's, there's more there than, and this is what the rabbis would call a remez, a hint of something deeper. That's what the term means. And uh, anyway, for what it's worth. So there are, there is a doctrine of mysteries in the uh, scripture itself. In the Greek, the word is mysterion. We use the word mystery in a different sense than the Greeks did. Uh, we think we use the word mystery as something that's sort of unsolved. No, the word mysterion in the Greek really means a secret that is now revealed. It's typically used of a password within a club or something. It's something that's a small group know about and they reveal it to you. That's sort of a mysterion is a revealed secret. You know, you know what a secret is? That's something you tell one person at a time, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, Mark 4 talks about the kingdom of God, God's will is spoken kind of the mystery of God's will, Ephesians 1 9, the mystery of Christ in Colossians 2, several times. The mystery of the gospel is alluded to in Romans 16 and also Ephesians 6. The mystery of the rapture is specifically called a mystery in 1 Corinthians 15. And Israel's blindness regarding the rapture is a mystery, the mystery in Romans 11 25. The church is a mystery in Ephesians 3, Ephesians 5, Colossians 1, Revelation 1. Uh, it's even called a mystery in Revelation, the, the, the lampstands and so forth. There's also two negative ones. These are all sort of positive things, and, and one can get very specific about them, but yet we should also allow that some of these probably overlap, you know, so I'm not going to get into that thing right here. But uh, the mystery of iniquity, 2 Thessalonians 2 7. Boy, that's an interesting study to figure out what that really is. It can't be as simple as sin, because the Holy Spirit's restraining iniquity, and if, 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 just, if it's just sin, then he's doing a poor job. No, it's something deeper, something else that's going on here. And uh, the mystery of Babylon, of course, Revelation 17 is a classic one. So um, those are mysteries that w are, are worth study and getting into. But let's just keep moving. Um, Deuteronomy 30, uh, the ultimate restoration. Verse 1, 
And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children and thy heart, with all thy soul. You know, this is... Uh, <laughs> see, we're, we're, we've sort of shifted gears here. This isn't the blessing, you know, the blessing and cursing in a direct sense. It's a prediction. It says... And it shall come to pass when all these things shall come on. So he's predicting their failure. He's predicting their failure. We're going to find that there are seven great promises in this chapter. I'll let you do, develop that from your own notes. I'm not going to underline it all the way for you. I'll give you some as we go, but that's just that your challenge, if you will. See, the promises God's going to make here are unconditional because he knows that they're going to, he knows what they're going to do. The, the, the nation is going to be plucked off the land for their faithlessness. That's predicted here. See, when all these things shall come to pass, the blessing and the curse, thou shalt call them mine. Among all the nations where the Lord thy God hath driven thee, he's predicting the diaspora. It's predicted right here. See, some of these words may be familiar to you because there have been movies made recounting the Holocaust. And the, 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 the documentary will have pictures of the barbed wire fences and the tramps and all this stuff. The narrative is just reading Deuteronomy. And it's really spooky. One of them is called The Return, I think. I forget. Uh, I forget the different... Uh, there's been a number of those films that are quite, quite well done. In verse 2, Thou sh- and shalt return unto the Lord thy God. See, the good news is their return to God is promised here. We know they ultimately will. They are going to come back to God. And uh, now you can ask, it: will that be a result of their obedience or God's grace? <laughs> What's the answer to that one? God's grace. God's grace. But um, they're, they're, they're going to be obedient. Uh, they're not going to be returned because of their obedience, but they will be obedient because of their return, ultimately. Then, then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. This verse, Deuteronomy 30, verse 3, is the first mention in the Bible of the return of the Messiah. Did you catch it? Then the Lord thy God will turn thy thy captivity, have compassion upon thee, and will return. Wow. In order for him to return, he had... (laughs) He must have left it. And gather thee from all the nations where the Lord thy God has scattered thee. See, not just Babylon. This isn't a Babylonian captivity thing. All the nations that they've been scattered. It's the diaspora here. If any of thine be driven out unto the uttermost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good, and multiply thee above thy fathers. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, and the heart of thy seed, to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. Boy, this is... uh, this whole idea of being spiritually actualized, we're, we're talking about not circumcision as an outward fleshly sign of the covenant. No, no, this is something deeper. This is what uh, Jeremiah talks a great deal about. And this is what, uh, what um, Jesus in, in, uh, Nehemiah, in uh, John 3 with, Nehemiah, uh, with uh, Nicodemus expected him, expected him to understand. And uh, so we're going to find that uh, this whole idea of the circumcision of the heart is developed in, uh, and reaffirmed in Jeremiah and in Hosea, and Paul in the book of Romans. And so you can make your own search and go through that. It will be rewarding to you. God always rewards the diligent. The Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies. This is the sixth thing that he promises here. And on them that hate thee, which persecuted thee. So Israel's enemies are destined for persecution. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments which I command thee this day. Now, there is something that is going to precede their turnaround. They are going to accept them, but God is going to drive them to the wall 
to do so. That's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble by Jeremiah 30, verse 7. And a key verse is Hosea 5, verse 15. That's why I didn't want to go down too many side trips here, but I had to throw this in here to give you focus on this. The last verse in Hosea 5, God says, I will go and return to my place. That phrase itself is provocative. That means he must have left it. I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction they will seek me. It says early in the King James, the Hebrew word really means earnestly, intensely. I will go and return to my place. This is Jesus talking. He's left. He's re he will I'll return to my place. I will go and return to my place by the Father until they acknowledge their offense. That's specific and singular. What offense? The rejection of their Messiah. That's why Jesus wept as he rode that donkey in Jerusalem. If you'd only known this thy day, the things that belong to your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. Until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, that's the tribulation, they will seek me earnestly. And he does. They petition him to return. They flee to Petra, as he instructed them to in Matthew 24, and he will return to fight with them there, and the blood, his blood-stained garments are described in Isaiah 63. Not his blood, the blood of his enemies. He's a he, kinsman redeemer, but he's also our avenger of blood. Praise God. Verse, th uh, verse 9 of Deuteronomy 30. And the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thine hand, in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle, in the fruit of thy land, for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiced over thy fathers. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the law, and if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, for this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. See, God did not require of them anything that was incomprehensible or unattainable. That's the whole point of verse 11 there. This command, which I command thee this day, it's not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It's not something that is hard to understand. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it to us, that we may, may hear it and do it. Neither is beyond the sea that thou shouldest, who shall go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very nigh, very near unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. You know, it's interesting that... Um, uh, Paul draws upon this in the book of Romans. He used the same proverbial style in Romans 10. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. You're at a crossroads, guys. See, so you're, you're at a fork in the road. On one hand, you've got life and good. And the other side, well, you've got death and evil. What's your pick? That's really what in effect he's saying. This is a, he's calling for a decision here. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments. Those are three different things, but I, for us it doesn't matter. <laughs> to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments. That thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away, and worship other gods, and serve them. I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whither thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both you and thy seed may live. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days. That thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. This whole thing is about the law of love. That's really what we're talking about. They are faced with a key decision. To love God so wholeheartedly that they will live in accordance with God's revealed will 
as outlined in his written word, the Torah, which is what we're talking about here. By the way, in, in a number of these verses, I, I'm not sure I caught it when we, I meant to, as, go, as we're going through, it's not the, the, um, the, the scriptures as we think of them, it's the, it's the, it's the we're talking, the, the book of the covenant was the, the specifics that Moses was talking about. It's a, a, a segment of the Torah, if you will. But anyway, now Paul develops the same issue and leans on the same foundation here in Romans chapter 10. 9, 10, and 11 are the three chapters in Romans that deal with Israel. And Jesus deals with the same issue when in that famous night meeting with Nicodemus in John 3. This is the same decision that's in front of all of us. We're not under the law, praise God. But we're called to the same wholeheartedness. God has given us far more blessing than he has enumerated on the blessing side on Mount Gerizim. Because all the things there were, were pedestrian in a sense compared to the blessings you and I enjoy here. The freedoms we have, the abundance we enjoy, the, the, uh, all of that. And the revealing of God's Word, where they had the Torah, they had the books of Moses, we have much more. They could anticipate the Messiah only by faith, only as a, as a dream on the horizon. We can see the Messiah as a fait accompli. He did come. He was the son of David. He was born where he was uh, and raised in Nazareth. And, and he, he, he fulfilled over a hundred specifications in his death alone. He, 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 he uh, died for our sins, was buried, he rose again the third day. The, 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 the core achievement, the crucifixion of Christ was not a tragedy. It was an achievement, an achievement by the ruler of the universe to demonstrate ultimate love. God knew that Israel would fail and provided for their failure. God knew that we can't perform, that we will also fail. He also knew that if he left man alone, that he would get himself in a predicament that nothing less than the death of God would prevail to extricate man from that predicament. And he laid out his whole plan of redemption, which involved God entering into his creation and fulfilling the requirements of his righteousness and paying the price so that he could extend his grace and mercy and forgiveness to us by our accepting what he's done on faith. And that's his only requirement, is that we trust him. He finds a different way every day, probably, to ask us the question, do you really trust me? And uh, he challenges us in blessing. Do we, keep an, do we keep our eye on the source of the blessing? He challenges us in darkness, in the valleys. In fact, those valleys are often a primary call to intimacy with him. But what he's looking for is not us following rules and regulations. That's not what this book is about. It's us having a wholehearted devotion to him and to walk moment by moment, hand in hand with him. Not asking him to bless what we're doing, but for us to do what he's blessing. We have a, uh, a challenging book here because many people see the book of Deuteronomy as the law. Indeed it was. But it's interesting that Jesus Christ quotes from Deuteronomy more than any other book of the Bible. Deuteronomy is, 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 the, is Moses' epistle on the law. Summary of it. Challenge to keep it. But the law itself is a mechanism by which we can demonstrate our love for him. That's really what it's all about. It's a love relationship. And the ultimate love relationship, which vastly eclipses the one we've read here, is the one that we enjoy from Ephesians, Colossians, and the New Testament. 
Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. In our next two sessions, we'll finish the book of Deuteronomy. It's going to be a very, very different kind of session because we're going to provide for continuity. We're going to um, this whole hand over to Joshua. The strange circumstances that surround the death of Moses. Uh, this bizarre uh, allusion in the book of Jude that Michael fought with Satan over Moses' body. What on earth is all that about? And uh, the whole handover, uh, it, it, it's the handover from, from the, uh, the wilderness wanderings into the conquest of the land. So let's, uh, let's bow our hearts.